Welcome. Uh, my name is Jeff Skinner. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at London Business School. And it's an um, absolute delight to uh, be able to introduce uh, the latest in our series of uh, this uh, wonderful sort of get together, which is Ask the, Ask the Entrepreneur in collaboration with a company of entrepreneurs. This evening, we've got a great topic to discuss. It's all about, well, I suppose I could say it's all about going bankrupt. It's all about uh, the traumas of running out of cash and what to do about it. I guess that's the best way of doing it. And to host this evening, I'm going to hand over to Rick Lowe. Rick was actually the person who got us into this uh, originally all those years ago, introduced me down, had a cup of coffee and decided exactly. between us that it was good to really do something together and and, um, and and here we are. So Rick, over to you to introduce our expert for the evening and to run away the, with the proceedings. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jeff, and, uh, and good evening and welcome, everybody. Um, as Jeff said, my name's Rick Lowe and I happen to be the immediate past master of the company of entrepreneurs. And really on behalf of, of the company of entrepreneurs, um, I'm delighted to be hosting this evening. Um, as Jeff alluded to, it's a very uh, crucial or jugular topic for business and entrepreneurs, and it is cash crashes and cash flow, uh, or probably all the things we don't like to think about but keep us awake at night. Um, just for those of you, before we jump into the main proceedings, who, who don't know what the company of entrepreneurs is, essentially we are a livery business, a livery company. We, we are affiliated to the uh, Lord Mayor of London and the City of London Corporation. So we follow the, the Lord Mayor's agenda, and we promote business and we promote the City of London Corporation. And really what our speciality is, is entrepreneurship. So we, we have a very varied um, uh, membership, probably about 170 members now. And within that membership, we've got all kinds of different entrepreneurs at different stages, um, some ser serial entrepreneurs, some have been hugely successful, some of them quite famous as well. And what we try and do is promote entrepreneurship as a trade. Um, we also give back. So we have a big uh, uh, philanthropic side to what we do. Part of what we're doing tonight is our outreach program, which as Jeff is saying we put together probably two or three years ago now. So it really is a delight to be here uh, on behalf of the company of entrepreneurs. Now, our guest expert this evening is Christine Nicholson. Uh, she is a seasoned entrepreneur in her own right. And she really is here to share her experiences this evening, her insights and her knowledge on all things cash flow. Because as they say in business, cash is king. You know, you don't want to run out of cash. It, uh, it can be the end of the journey for you. Now, her business life, she's going to tell us more about it when, when her and I start talking in a second. But really, her first business was Contemplation Homes. That was nursing care with a difference. And it was built really by acquiring nursing homes that needed investment. And Christine quickly applied a blueprint that included culture operations, high standards and care with transparency. So I'm really keen to, to understand that. And uh, there's been a couple of other businesses as well, I believe, that Christine can share with us. Um, she's also had some very big challenges in her journey. I'm not going to tell you about that now, but I will bring that out in our discussion. Uh, so please sit back and listen intently because I, I know Christine as a lady has got a lot to say and to offer. Um, she's also a member of the Company of Entrepreneurs, so I do know her from the court. Um, so welcome, Christine. Hello and hi, everybody. I'm really pleased to see how many people are listening to what is actually often seen as a really dull subject. But, <laughs> oh, my God, it's so important. Excellent. And it's probably worth starting with your journey, just to give us a snapshot of how you started, where you came from and, and what that journey led to. Yeah, so I haven't had um, a, like a traditional upbringing or, or even a traditional, you know, a, a typical uh, educational background. My father didn't believe in education for women for a start off. Um, and when I was growing up, we were really poor and so I started my first business when I was 10, but I didn't realize that that's what I was doing. And I developed this cooperative of women who were knitting sweaters. And I just, I just pulled them all together. I, I arranged for the um, provision of the wool 
they did the knitting. I got them these jumpers sewn up and then sold them back to the knitting shop. But I, I didn't understand that that was entrepreneurship. But it, what I did understand, even at that young age, that it was about the flow of cash and mostly yeah. the flow of cash into my pocket so that my family could be fed. So much later on, um, when I started the, what I would call my first grown up business, that was really about buying what, what was effectively failing businesses because they'd been undercapitalized and uh, actually capitalizing them, investing in them so that they were generating cash that then produced those cash flows for future investment. And what I'm really proud about with, um, with, the, with the way that contemplation was set up, I mean, terrible name, by the way, but uh, was the fact that the entire business model was around generating funds to be reinvested. And I never had to go back to my investors. In fact, in 18 years now, that business has grown by reinvesting its profits, by making sure it's profitable and therefore having the flow of cash. And then I, I, I built a second business again, very, very quickly. It, it, it was really about the flow of cash. It started with zero capital. Um, within a year, I was turning over a, a million pounds. And it was really just about what, what really kept it was the, this fact that the, this cash was flowing really, really quickly. Then I had the shock of my life because I went to work in a business that I was told, come and take this 5 million turnover business, grow it to 10 million as part of a team, and then there'll be this massive exit and you'll get the shares uh, as a benefit. Um, and only to discover that four hours into the job, there was one, there was no money in the bank. I actually found an entire drawer that was just full of unopened invoices. Wow. And the five million turnover business was actually nearly five million pounds in debt. Mm. And wow. I said, you know, you need to fire me. This is day one. You, you need to fire me. You can't afford me. Uh, you need to fire, uh, or, you know, this significant number of the staff. Um, you know, we. I, I need two million pounds to keep this going or I'm just going to have to call the receiver. Wow. And wow. that was the beginning of an 18 month journey. Thankfully didn't fire me. Um, right. But the eight, next 18 months was the most challenging of my entire career. And there were days where I would just, uh, sometimes I would be still sat at my desk at 4 a.m. And I would literally wow. just cry. And I mean, <laughs> literally just break down, get it all out. And then pull myself together, ready for the first staff arriving for eight o'clock in the morning. Because mm. we had to, we had to get up, dress up, and show up as yeah. if the company mm. was still very, very solvent, and bring that confidence uh, to the rest of the workforce. Wow, wow! Um, and uh, and, and I, I guess just learning from those different experiences, um, you've been right in the deep end with cash because there are some businesses that don't miraculously don't suffer cash problems for whatever reason, maybe a quirk of fate and luck. But generally, we do know that the values of running a business revolve around the horrendous cash position. So what, where would you say the importance of cash flow is? It might seem like an obvious question, but as an entrepreneur, Christian, there's so many things you've got to worry about, people, operations, yeah, funding, shareholders, the lot. But where, where do you see cash in terms of that, that priority? See, for me, cash is always the number one thing. And I think it's because if you've got your finger on the cash pulse and, you're actually, and you actually understand the flow of cash through your business and all of the timing and how you can influence it, because yeah. a lot of people go, oh, there's nothing I can do. There's, <laughs> there's loads of things that you can do. But, but having the confidence to know how the cash flows in your business it actually does make everything else easier because there's nothing worse than, than if you're worrying about cash and you don't have control, you absolutely can't stand in front of your staff and say, don't worry, you're going to be paid at the end of the month. Yeah, the no, sure. They get the first inkling that there's any concern about that. There are certain people who, who are just, they're not, they're not even going to ask the question. They're going to go, sure. oh, I'm not going to get paid. And they're off. So wow. it's really handle cash and quite a lot of other things will handle themselves 
are, yeah. are certainly in my experience. Sure. No, that, that's a really good point, actually, about how, how everything kind of hangs off it because it's got such a defining factor. And what are some of those typical challenges that cash flow presents? The, the, the lack of cash flow, uh, and, and this is really it, because you can have, I mean, I've seen businesses that generate a lot of cash, but it's because of the timing and the flow. So, so the, the, for me, one of the big challenges that I see a lot is around collecting cash from your customers. Mm. And yeah. people seem to think that, I mean, I particularly see this in startups and small businesses where they say, Oh, but I can't ask my big customer to pay me any faster. Yes, you can. Because asking doesn't cost anything. And if you're a valuable service to them, it's not in their interest to make you struggle or go under. Now, it's not also not their problem if you're just not managing your cash because you're selling at too low a price or you've got too bigger overheads. And, and all of those form you know, part of this kind of circle of, of cash through your business. So, so actually having the flow and feeling that you haven't got control of it, you absolutely, if you haven't got control of your cash flow, you haven't got control of your business. No, so of course you haven't. And saying, oh, that's not something I can control. Well, trust me, I've been on my knees in front of my customers. I've also been on my knees to my suppliers trying to bring yeah. the two ends uh, together. Mm whilst we rebuild the, the, the a business model that allows the flow of cash to run through us. But, but and, that control and, is key. And, and that's very interesting talking there about your customers. And, but it's probably a very different conversation with the supplier because that's where you own that, owe them money. And, and what's your advice on broaching that prickly subject? Well, I, I know from talking to a couple of people who are actually on this call, um, that uh, it, sometimes it can be a real, a real struggle. You, you know, you've, 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 you've got to buy stuff from your suppliers. You've usually then got to do something to whatever you've bought before you then sell your customers. Um, so, I, I mean, I go back to that, understanding the flow of cash. Actually going back to your suppliers and giving them confidence that you can pay, but it's a matter of timing, it is, especially if you're struggling, just be honest. If your suppliers are part of your supply chain and it's a valued relationship on both parts, then they will give you, um, they'll give you some latitude. Yeah. If it's no, not, sure. if it's just a commodity buy, then you're probably, you might not be with the right supply partner. But if you can't actually be open and honest with your staff open and honest with your customers and open and honest with your suppliers um then frankly you're put your well for start off you're not in an organization that i want to be part of no the, the more transparency you have, the better it is it, it, it's very interesting there christine you've talked about being open and being honest because i think that takes a lot of courage as, as an entrepreneur because as you were saying when you're at the top of the tree your, your staff are looking at you for all the answers and and Quite often, we don't have all those answers. But I think being human and honest it, it is a really powerful, powerful way of, uh, of navigating through. And j just one of the things I wanted to talk about was, as entrepreneurs, we all tend to be very gung-ho and, and very focused on a new idea, the new thing that's shiny and new and getting out there and making things happen. And quite often, we can overlook those details and processes, particularly financial. How do you advise nascent entrepreneurs, people just starting out, on best to prepare for this and, and build a robust financial element into that business? So the absolute key thing really is making sure that you're making enough margin so that you actually cover your overhead. So this, the key thing is understanding that relationship between the margin that you're turning and the overheads that they've got to cover. So the, the number of business owners that I know that actually don't understand break even or what their break even numbers. So they start at the beginning of the month and they don't know how much, mm. how much they've got to sell during the month to break even for their overhead. 
or they start investing in loads of uh, stuff as overhead without actually really looking at exactly what value that, that whatever the cost of the overhead is bringing. And uh, I mean, my biggest advice for any startup is for God's sake, don't buy swag. Like do not buy any ego purchase. Nobody's interested in your logo. Nobody wants a pen or a mug and it's just a waste of money. Like seriously, you've got better things to spend your money on, um, especially right at the beginning. Cause you might feel like you've got a long runway. You have no idea sure. how long that runway is gonna last. Uh, and I see that in technology businesses. But, sure. Understand your margin, understand what your break even is and understand, and, I, and if I say this once, I will say it a thousand times, understand how cash flows through your business, how it actually moves from one stakeholder to another and then how it cycles back into yeah. your, um, uh, your business. And, and, and do you advise, if, if, an, if an entrepreneur doesn't have the skills around finances, how should they approach that area of their business should they get someone in should they go high people what's some ideas for for a young business to be able to underpin that aspect of their business well the first thing i'll say is god never underestimate the power of youtube like there isn't (laughs) anything that you can't learn on the internet so if you don't understand the language of finance like i'm going to do something shameless now i wrote a book called five minute finance now i wrote that book entirely for one client who just really wasn't getting it. And he kept on saying, oh, I'm number blind, I don't understand. So when I, once I wrote the book, we decided to publish it because accountants were asking me for the book. But, but actually, the, your accountant, and everybody has to have one, uh, but your accountant should be the one that's guiding you. And if you're a startup with an accountant that understands that whole startup concept, they probably won't be charging you bucket loads of money now because they'll make sure that they get that back later. Because if you survive and and thrive it's in their interest if you haven't got an accountant that understands and is interested in startups then swap them for one that has um sure. i've got some checklists and everything about how to get a decent uh, accountant which if anybody wants them I'll, I'm, I'm very happy to share i'll send them to jeff um so that you've got them but um but the key thing is make sure that you're educated do not use the excuse i am number blind uh, the only the only thing you can do is you can educate yourself. There's three things that I would do: um, uh, get an education on some really basic finance, and how you do that is, is you can do it through school, you can do it through the internet, or you can go and ask somebody who's already in business. Make sure you've got a really decent accountant and um, that really understands the position that your business is in. Uh, and the, the third thing I would do is get a mentor that actually understands and has been there. Excellent. Uh, and Great advice. Famous name. You need someone who actually has got their hands dirty, lost some night's sleep, cried all over their desk. <laughs> I, I, I think I wish I'd met you and I set my first business up, Christine, and taken that approach. I think I spent five years trying to bang myself up at my head against a brick wall. But that, that's, that's life and learning curve for me. Um, I know there's uh, been some times in your life when you've, you've hit that rock bottom. I know you alluded to that to me earlier. Would you like just to expand on that to, to show how dire those consequences became for you as a person? Yeah, absolutely. So I've personally never taken my own businesses into liquidation. And I feel very blessed to have not had to do that. Um, But I've operated with other people's businesses where I've come in from a crisis perspective and, and had no choice but to take them into liquidation. And that is just one of the most it's one of the most stressful uh, situations that, that, that from a business perspective that I've ever been in. Um, I've personally been homeless where uh, as a result of literally losing everything apart from the clothes I stood up in and, I, and not knowing where I was going to sleep that night. And that, that, that period of homelessness lasted for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, that's the thing about with business is that, you know, the highs can be incredibly high and oh my God, the lows can be the absolute lowest. Um, but, sure. you know, my favorite quote is rock bottom. It's a really good platform on which to build. 
And <laughs> I, I, as I said earlier, I, I'd love to claim that as my own quote, but it's actually J.K. Rowling. And uh, yeah, who knew she was a good writer? Um, but, uh, and it's so true, but there are times when you will feel like you are absolutely on your knees. And those are the times where you may think is now the time to give up. And in some cases it might be, and you just got to be really honest with yourself. Sure. Wow. And, and just in terms of that whole experience, how did you get through it? You must have had something keeping you positive in some way to get you through it what, what was can you remember what that was at the time yeah sheer bloody mindedness right. you know, when, I, when, when I was really really young um you know I had a father who didn't believe in education for women and he used to say oh I mean, it's because of his own Victorian upbringing but he used to say nothing more is demanded of a woman than she operates a broom and a twin tub washing machine <laughs> and it really stuck me stuck struck me as being, you know, I'm not the only person who will have been through a similar kind of experience, maybe not as extreme as that. But I, I almost, I, I always thought I've been in a better place than this and I will be in a better place tomorrow. And it's wow. just about taking that, you know, an inch is a cinch, a mile is a trial. And all you've got to mm. do is move forward one inch and, the, and, and eventually you get somewhere. But sure. uh, it's, um, yeah, it, you know, every day the sun rises. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and that's a great story from a sense of just having the self-belief and the determination that, as you said, the, the sun will rise and, mm. and things will improve. And do, do you think that learning curve, as difficult as it was, that learning experience was a... Uh, looking back now, it actually benefited you? You think there was a positive in that, that it taught you to be more resilient? Or, 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 how, or how would you describe that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually really lucky, I think, because I think, I, I think I'm naturally quite um, mentally resilient. Um, but if I think about today, you know, if I started, if I woke up this morning and thought, oh, um, I'm a bit concerned about... Um, you know, have I got clients for the next week or, you know, it literally, if I'd woken up this morning with no clients and no income, um, I'd probably be a whole lot less worried now than I was maybe 15 years wow. ago, purely wow. because it, it's nothing personal. It's, mm. it, if I'm in that situation, then it's something I'm responsible for. It's my life. I choose, you know, I've chosen all the things that have taken me here. I had made choices and, and become really successful before in some of my other businesses. Mm. I can definitely do, do it again. Sure. And, you know, it's, every day is a new day. You can lose absolutely everything today. I think yeah. the thing that I've really benefited from is I have lost everything more than once. And I'm still here. Wow. <laughs> and I can still smile and laugh about it. You know, there's yeah. a blue sky between it. But, you know, nothing's managed to kill me yet. And, Honestly, well, it's tried. <laughs> I mean, that's an amazing story of resilience, really. And, and interesting just to jump in on that point, because they say that most successful people, if you said you, you, can, you can't have both things, you can't keep the money and the experience, you can only have what most people would give the money back because the experience gives them the knowledge to be able to go and do it again. Whereas if you've just got money, you don't have the experience to go and create again. So... It's, it's an interesting concept for all, all entrepreneurs. Um, just kind of shifting gears slightly, when your business starts to get developed and moving from a startup to, to high growth, and, and that has its own uh, impact on cash flow because growth costs money, as we yeah. know. And what are some of the kind of disciplines that an entrepreneur, as they are growing, needs to build in? Things like budgets and forecast. I mean, do, do you... So in my business, for example, we have a running forecast and a running budget each year. It moves about, of course it does, but that discipline has really helped me feel like I've got control because I can see numbers. How important do you think that is when you're growing a business? Because you're burning cash generally when you're growing. All of the businesses that I've gone into that have been in crisis, and, and you know, some of these have been growing really, really quickly, 
all of them have had the same problem and that is the you know the, the fact that growth literally sucks up cash like you've got like no tomorrow and they haven't yeah. really thought about the, the flow of cash if you did nothing else and if all you did was cash flow forecasting and you didn't do anything else then 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 that that would be a really good start really good start because a, a profit profit and loss statement doesn't tell you about the flow of cash and actually as long as you're making profit then uh, and and you can keep keep your finger on that pulse you, you should be okay but the flow of cash when that starts to seize your entire business starts to seize it's a bit like stopping your blood flow in your in your um, in your in your body. You stop the flow of blood to your brain, and you'll be brain dead in four four to six minutes. And it's yeah. exactly the same. And so many people go, "Oh, it's too difficult. Oh, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it." Learn. It's a really key lesson, and it's the biggest thing I see. I've seen literally hugely profitable businesses go under or as near mm. as damn it go under purely because they they haven't had that flow of cash never ever go and try borrow money or try and raise capital when you're desperate <laughs> and we've all done that <laughs> oh yeah it's the most expensive it's the most stressful it's the most distracting and if you do a cash flow forecast it does a couple of things it makes it easier to get investment because one you can do it at the right time Two, it makes it easier to get the investment because you can show the investors where their money is going to be spent and you can do it really, really clearly. And it actually gives the investors more confidence in your ability to run a business. Sure, and, uh, that's a very good so, point. Yeah, so many people get caught up in that, oh my God, I don't know how to do spreadsheets. Right, well, for a start off, Fiverr, Upworker, people per hour, you can get all of these things done for like tuppence. Because um, I know that if you go and get your accountant to do it, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they often don't actually understand your business model. Whereas a couple of hours explaining to a spreadsheet, uh, I hate to work, use the word guru, but, um, you know, somebody who actually knows their way around a spreadsheet. Um, and, and, and they will be overjoyed to do the job. So that you're actually giving the, a job you hate to somebody who finds joy. In, I mean, there are strange people out there who get a spreadsheet mm. and that's their, lights them up. Um, so just exactly. go one of those. I mean, frankly, if you've got a teenager who likes to do spreadsheets, some a left-brained teenager who likes to do spreadsheets, get them to do it. But get somebody who genuinely knows what their, what their way around a, a spreadsheet and just get it done. Or, or use a tool. I mean, there's so many forecasting tools now that are really, really easy yeah. to use. It kind of sounds like there's no excuses really nowadays because, as you said, there's so many tools available, but it's the emotional connection of connecting to cash if people aren't used to it. Um, mm -hmm. well, during those, those growth periods, one of the things I've noticed is as you look at your cash flow, it is sometimes feast and famine or quite often. And how brutal do you need to be on overheads in terms of saying, hang on a minute, you know, by the looks of things, we could have a problem in three to six months. So should you take action immediately? How do you approach those more tricky challenges as you're growing and you can see your cash moving about? Yeah, see, there is a balance between investing in growth in the things that are really valuable um and see for me that whole approach to uh kind of spending on overheads is a bit like productivity as an entrepreneur you have three jobs getting and keeping customers staying legal and making getting and keeping customers or staying legal more efficient okay so whenever people go oh i'm really overwhelmed I've got too much to do and I've got a to-do list like this. I always go, right, okay, mark on your to-do list which one of those three those tasks are doing. And it's exactly the same for, for cash. So what you're spending, I mean, you can literally, like, how easy is this? Get your bank statement for the last three months and then go down and look at everything you're spending. And if, it, if it's either getting and keeping customers, keeping you legal, or doing something that invests in getting and keeping customers more efficient or keeping legal more efficient, then keep those things. Everything else you can ditch. 
Right. And, and wow. there's a temptation when you're feeling really flush. And this is why the famine and feast thing happens, because there's a temptation when you're feeling really flush. Like I know I said, don't buy swag earlier. It, that's when the temptation comes in. You know, it's like, oh, we'll get some mugs and, and pens and things and we'll give them to our clients. And it's like, I don't know what the obsession with stationery is, because most clients really couldn't care less about it. I mean, they can all do without uh, without a mug with your name on it. Um, but when you're really flush, it's like, oh, we can spend money on that kind of stuff. And and but then you know you get you you have those periods where your cash flow is really tight. And and uh, trust me, if you could get the money back from all those stupid mugs and pens that you bought, you would. Yeah. So why buy them in the first place? So I know this sounds like yeah. I'm a complete misery and. Uh, because uh, uh, trust me, business should be fun. Because why else would you do it? Yeah. Um, but some of those things they sound fun, but if you're short of cash, they're they're, they're not fun anymore. And and there's nothing worse than the misery of not knowing whether you can pay your staff at the month. No. At the month. So no, the, no. those there's three yeah. jobs. Everything you spend on should do those three jobs, and it all comes back to rule one: do not buy swag. <laughs> I like that. And, and it also highlights because it's very easy when you grow in a business to lose sight of what you actually should be doing and, and going off towards shiny and new things and on different adventures. And those things can be extremely costly if you go outside your, let's say, circle of expertise for sure. Um, and I'm just aware that we want to talk to a couple of businesses as well. And, and maybe just a couple of quick fire kind of personal questions from you, from, from, from my point of view to you. I mean, what is what would you have done differently if you if you could run the clock back and, and had your time again? Is there anything specific around your business in general you would have done differently, knowing what you know today? Yeah, that's a really difficult one because, uh, frankly, in every single business, there is definitely things that I would do differently. Um, I have to say, I've always, but in, in relation to cash, for my businesses, it's always started there. And it always will right. do because I know what it's like to have nothing. Um, yeah. And um, but from a life perspective, like I have had my ups and downs, but you know what? I wouldn't change a minute of it because I wouldn't be here. And I like yeah. where I am right, right, right now. Excellent. And just I'm just uh, aware of some of the questions that are coming in. There's one very good one here from from Azim talking about invoice discounting. It, it's probably worth touching on that, Christine, in terms of access to cash. Would you just like to throw your thoughts in on that? Yeah. I, I, in the old days and by the old days, I mean more than 10 years ago, um, in, invoice discounting used to be sort of it'd be clunky and expensive and 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 difficult and it, there's so many choices now so I, I if your business model is such that you can't get short uh, payment terms from your customer and you can't get longer payment terms from your suppliers and those are the two people that you go to first um, then uh, actually getting finance in in that as flexibly as you can but there's always there always is a cost to it sure. and sometimes that cost is the administrative burden sometimes it's the uh, uh, the setup cost or the um interest is the word i'm looking for um yeah. but i think it's actually being aware of exactly what the cost and the risk is to you and also the perception that that um Again, in the old days, uh, invoice discounting used to have the perception that you were a business in trouble, but that, that doesn't count. Yeah, anymore. a lot of businesses use it now. Uh, absolutely. And if it's a fundamental part of your business model, fantastic. Um, but please don't use it as desperation because uh, it will be seriously expensive, seriously burdensome, and you might be better off instead of doing discount um, invoice discounting, it might be better off if you just built a better relationship with your customers yeah. and your suppliers. Uh, I think I think the, the the issue of credit and and finance and growth is always a challenge, isn't it? And uh, one to one to think about. Um, I'd just like now to look look at a couple of the businesses that uh, we're going to introduce, and Christine's going to talk to and give some of her knowledge and mentorship. It's been a fascinating story this evening, Christine, so far, and I, I know that, that these businesses are going to benefit from your knowledge. The first one is Amuga, and it's owned by Nazi. 
Um, it's LinkedIn for cleaners, gardeners, and hairdressers. So it's six months old. I'd like to introduce Nazi and to Christine and really the floor's yours to, to share your thoughts and, and ideas on, on Nazi, any challenges you've got on your side with cash in your business. So do you want to, to share your, um, your startup journey so far? Thank you, Christine. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've been working on the business for some time. We launched it in late December, 2020. And the launch was immediately after building the first version of the product, which is just you know, a fancy website effectively. And we had a financial plan, understanding that you know, as a network and a marketplace, where the marketplace is enabled by the network, we have to build a community of people before we can start showing them value. So there's probably going to be a period of time before we can actually attempt revenue. And so we're thinking of, it costs us money to just stay alive and get through the month. We raise money and then we burn again and then we raise. And so it's those blips of, of raising that are in the plan. You know, what do those look like over time? And being a first time founder also, I think just coming fresh out of business school and, and working on this business, the bootstrap part, which is the first blip is, you know, I put my savings in, that didn't take us very far. And the plan after that was to raise some money from outside people. Um, and you get into a difficult situation being a solo founder, being first time and having to do everything and not having strong resources around you. And then thinking, how do I move into fundraising mode right now when I have zero, I have minus 10 hours in a day to allocate to anything new. And so I took what I thought was the easy route out was to think of the one angel investor that I had a good relationship with, who I had been speaking to about the kind of problem I was trying to solve. And I just, I was living in dreamland thinking, for sure, this is going to go right. By the end of December, we'll have closed, the bank account will be flush again, and we can move into this new phase of building up the community. And that was the only plan I had in place. And that December close ended up being an April close. And so for that sort of January, February, March, and into April, we were down on zero, freshly in the market, struggling to even do customer service with the few people who were hopping onto the platform. Um, it was just a really big struggle. And it was, it was a very tough time on me trying to figure out how to traverse this thing and, and still trying to remain positive about the fundraise. So, so uh, what's your funding like now? Are you still fundraising for the next, uh, the next round? So, you know, I think if there's one thing I've learned, it's that you should always be fundraising because you need to have a plan B, C, D, you know, all the way down. Um, and these relationships take time to build. The story that you're telling to investors is not in a five minute pitch. It's starts with a five minute pitch and then it's, you know, three to six months of updates and bringing them along for the journey. So as much as we sort of recently raised money, um, it's a small amount and it doesn't take you very far. And so I, you know, I, I would have always had my eye on the, on the next race, but I have it, you know, on the wall, above my bed, you know, sticky noted onto my computer, um, always, always be working on the next race. And you talked about, you know, fundraising being effectively a full-time job. And then, then you've got the, the, you know, the day job of being the chief exec. And um, which, I, you know, I know from experience is, is a real challenge. How are you separating the two roles or, or aren't you? Yeah, I'd say it's still, still poorly um, because our team remains small. Um, but I think what I understand a lot clearer now is the time frame to death. And I think the process that I'm going to need to follow to get into this into a good position with this next fundraise. Um, and so what's clear to me now is that I have to dedicate, you know, probably a day or two of my week to working on this fundraise, even though it may be, let's say six months out. Um, I need to make sure I never get too bogged down with the day-to-day -day running that I'm not working on new relationships, conversations, et cetera, that, that will move me closer to the next fundraise. 
it would be great if I could sort of duplicate myself and then have a bit more resource to to yeah. focus on that. Um, yeah. And that's something I need to work on for sure. I mean, the one the one key thing that I'll say to to you and actually to everybody who's listening is if you think fundraising is ever going to be easy, forget it. You're deluding yourself. It's always going to take you twice as long as you imagine to raise half as much as you want. You're never going to ask for enough. Um, and you need to be absolutely crystal clear who you're talking to, um, because you can waste literally months grooming people through a process only to find that you've actually been talking to people who either didn't have the money in the first place, aren't interested in your projects, you don't really know why they're there. And so in the same way that when you're doing, um, when you're selling a product, uh, particularly one that's high ticket and uh, has a longer sales cycle, it's all about qualification. And I would much rather uh, see you in a room with 10 people who were actively engaged and really believed in your project, then I would see you in a room with a hundred people where you didn't actually know whether they actually got, even got what you do. And, and, and the great thing about you is, is the story, which is you know exactly where you are. You're, you're a, you know, a LinkedIn social network for unskilled workers so that they've actually got a community that really means something to them. You know, you're not mixing up corporates with non-corporates and, you know, it's a bit like the SME market and not also being separate from kind of corporates. But, um, but the, 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 I think the thing that you've learned and we've spoken before is that, you know, it, it is this going to take you much longer to get much less money, especially if you don't know who you're talking to. And if you're talking to investors, feel free to eliminate them, feel free to qualify them out. It will do you a favor, it will do your, it'll save you time and your reputation. They'll actually be really proud of you to eliminate them. They will go and tell their friends, their friends might be people who would invest in you. So mm -hmm. don't be ashamed or afraid of eliminating potential investors uh, and actually doing that qualifying round. It, it, it will save you a lot of heartache. I think that's a fantastic point, Christine, because when, when you're in this mode, you get introduced to a lot of people. Every conversation leads to two more conversations. And you're thankful for those introductions. They came from the goodness of someone's heart. And so you spend time on those engagements, but you need to you know, take a step back and then do the homework on the person. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think it's really some courage or just real diligence of, of then stepping back in and saying, it's been wonderful speaking with you, but for the following reasons, I'm not sure we should progress this conversation. And don't be afraid to do that really quickly. Like there's an old Russian saying, man who chases two rabbits starves. You've got to be really focused on making sure you know the right rabbit. And, and it's the same with your customers, you know, chase everybody, you'll get nobody. Be really focused. And you've said, you know, um, I think it was um, cleaners, gardeners, gardens, and hairdressers. hairdressers. Like, if I'm one of those three people, I know who I am. And, that, and therefore, yeah. that, those are the people that you're speaking to. Nazi, just, uh, just mindful of time, because we, we do want to move on to the other business. But thanks very much. And uh, some, some very sage advice, Christine, there for Nazi that's relevant to all of us. Thank you. To Thank you. Thank you. Um, so move, moving on, uh, I would like to now introduce our second business. That's called Roll Share. And Dave Smalls, the CEO, um, and it's the only talent platform that allows two people to apply for one job. So it sounds fascinating. It's nine months old. Dave, you, uh, you have the ear of Christine. Hi, Dave. Hey, hi, Christine. Good to see you again. Yeah, good, good to see you too. And uh, I was really pleased to speak to both the businesses very briefly before this uh, event and, um, and really get uh, under the skin of, uh, uh, of the challenges that you've got. Do you briefly want to outline the, the challenge that you've been through so far? Sure. Um, so we, we basically started the platform off to address a need that we personally had, which was we wanted more flexibility in our, in our corporate lives. Um, and there wasn't a real way of easily enabling that for ourselves, but also keeping the company that we worked for having 
you know, continual supply of, of cover. Um, so we, we went away to, to build a platform to help people job share. Um, and we saw the main requirement was individuals. So we built a platform for people rather than a platform for companies. And as we got into it, we, we seen great traction on the talent side, but we realized that we actually need to build something for companies as well, because that's where the, the money is really. And, and, um, and that, you know, doing it that way will allow us to scale because there's lots of talent coming onto the platform we don't charge them anything um, and then companies will join and, and work with us. And that realization that we needed to pivot and shift um, came after about eight or nine months of development work and in the market testing and talking to companies and everything. And then as we realized that we were going towards businesses, we realized that we're now going towards enterprise businesses. And there's a whole bunch of technical stuff that needs to happen around security, infosec, compliance, et cetera, to be able to sell to those size organizations. And um, bootstrapping is just not going to cut it. So we're like, okay, we need to go and do something about raising yeah, quickly. Um, so that, that's really where we are. And um, we, we ran through a period of um, probably about three or four months where we were bouncing around around the, the, the black and red line and, and just continually topping up with personal cash to, to keep the company going. Um, and we've successfully... 95% successfully doing the contracts this week and um, closed our angel round and, and where we should be in a good place in the next three or four weeks. And so that's, that's, that's the journey so far. Um, we've given ourselves enough runway with that raise. We believe to be able to do what we need to do to be able to do the next set of races thereafter. Um, but like you said, you never raise enough and I'm, I'm already seeing that like you know like I'm, I'm going through the forecasting and thinking about it again I'm like oh man we could have could have done a lot better if we had doubled the number um but there, there's another adage in the market which is you know, raise little and often um and a couple of our investors are very much in that line of sight thinking so so that that's really where we are um we've also in the last month and a half closed in writing but not on contract a few companies one of them being a big global investment bank with 180,000 employees and they love the concept, they love what we're doing and they'll be ripping out a solution that they built themselves and have been running for the last three or four years and replacing it with us. So that's very exciting. Um, so there's, there's cash from customers on the horizon in, and you know the cash that we're getting from investors will help us get. So, so what I understand from your business is that you're kind of um, giving recruitment a bit of a kick up the backside. And uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, JobShare. Uh, I've used it very successfully in the, in the past. So uh, this, this makes my heart sing. In, in terms of your ongoing fundraise, um, have you actually given uh, some thought to using your potential customers uh, as a source of fundraising? Because it, it feels like this is a huge benefit to them. So if they can give you money that makes it go faster, there's a definitely a deal that can be done there. Absolutely. And um, we, we have that as part of our next raise plan. And, and we're already circulating that with, our, with the um, institutional investors that we're talking to. So we're basically saying at a point later this year, we want to crowdfund and do it at, at scale um, in multiple markets. And um, we're trying to address multiple markets. And, and that's the other thing that makes our, our challenge a little bit interesting is this doesn't really exist in the US yet. Yeah. And if we don't do it fast, someone else is going to. So, so that's the other challenging growth thing. That yeah. we're, so um, we've actually been approached recently by two or three company global head of talent positions, you know, leaders within those companies saying, hey, can I get involved now? because um, this is really interesting. So that, yes, on both sides, you know, for the individuals and then also for companies. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. And the other, the other challenge with most traditional recruitment companies, from my experience, is that they, because the, the lead time is so long, it takes a long time for you to actually get the cash in. Um, uh, engaging with contracts that enable you to collect that cash much faster um it is definitely going to benefit you you're already disrupting the market so why would you do exactly the same as what all your competitors do in terms of your terms 
it, it, it's it, it, it's you can break the mold you can make it up yeah. right now uh, and so uh, don't resist any opportunity to do kick it up look I started off by charging for a particular service in advance and I was told oh nobody will ever pay in advance but they did mm. it's because I asked them it's definitely great advice and I will be bringing that in. We, we started off on that journey and we got the negative feedback as well. And yes. we've had more positive feedback recently. So yeah. definitely beginning to work. Yeah. It's funny because the people who told me that nobody will ever do it, they weren't my customers. All the customers never said a word. They yeah. just accepted that that's the way it was. Uh, but all the naysayers who, yeah. It's, uh, and I think you have to listen to your own internal uh, uh, guide for, for that one. Um, but I'm really pleased that you've got, uh, you, you've got the next um, raise in mind. And, and, you know, your customers would be really good sources of cash for zero equi equity if you can yeah. get cash flowing that way. Absolutely. The other thing that we were looking at in, in this and more recently, so is because we're now aiming towards enterprises, corporate venture capital arms that we, we had ignored in our first round of engagement because we didn't think that they would be interested, that they're actually really interested in what we're doing and using it within their own companies as well. So that's a new uncovering that we've scratched in the last few days. Yeah, uh, I think you're onto something really big and uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to... So in the years to in the future, then uh, I'm going to be saying, I knew them when they were little. <laughs> uh, so I really good. appreciate you sharing um, that and, uh, and, 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 and really showing a picture of how uh, getting, getting funding in can come from so many different sources. But also the fact that your business started out as one thing and you went on this journey that you weren't really expecting. Uh, and it's you know it still worked. Thanks very much, Dave, and thank, thanks, Christine, for that sage advice there. Um, um, just before we can move on to the breakout rooms, I'm just aware there's some a few good questions floating about that are getting answered within the group actually. Um, but there's one here, Christine, that I wanted to fire at you it's from, from Grace Yee, and it says, if you are going to partner with someone of an accounting finance background, what specific qualities? will you be looking for really on top of managing cash flow? So what other skills do you really need to, to draw in from that person? I'd really want them to have a lot of commercial awareness and I'd really want them to understand an entrepreneurial mindset. Mm. What they bring, if they've got an understanding of an entrepreneurial mindset and they've really got commercial skills, not many accountants do, um, it, it means that they can um, they act as a balance to the risk take, voracious risk taking that most entrepreneurs have, and so they need to not be a computer says no person. They need to say, "Here's how we can do that, but here's the cost and the uh, the opportunity cost, and and here's what needs to happen in the future." So actually, just shining a light on what what needs to happen, rather than being I've seen too many bean counters that a computer says no and they're complete naysayers. Uh, that is not the kind of accountant that you need to um, to, to partner with. No, I, I think that's really powerful advice, actually, because they do need to understand what an entrepreneurial business is all about. And, and that involves flexibility, shifting sands. Tomorrow, the world's going to reshape itself. And that in itself is a very big challenge for an accountant. So you don't need the bean counter. You need someone who's more well-rounded and is probably uh, quite seasoned in going through that, that emotional roller coaster with, uh, with the businesses. So uh, uh, that's a really powerful answer. Thanks for that, Christine. And just before we move to, to the breakout rooms, I mean, I've made two pages of notes, Christine. I thought I knew everything about cash flow, but clearly <laughs> I didn't. Um, so some of the key takeaways for me, right? Three things that you need to focus on. Education, educate yourself on finance, get a decent accountant, not a bean counter, and get yourself a mentor. I think that's really powerful advice for anyone starting out, actually, um, to kind of wrap around the financial piece of your business. 
Um, no ego purchases, so no fast cars, no no holidays, no private jets, no nights out at expensive restaurants, all those things we think we like and have no meaning and burn cash. So I like that one as well. And uh, then your, um, yeah, I think it's your JK Rowling, Rowling quote, Christine, rock bottom, it's a really good platform on which to build. Um, yeah. You've really proved to us tonight, actually, that you can get to rock bottom as much as it's about finance and cash and how important that is, which you've shared with us, it's about resilience as an entrepreneur and uh, self-belief. And I think uh, you, you, your journey has been really powerful for us. Um, and thanks for all those that sage advice and nuggets today. I'm sure we're all going to take that away and, and, uh, and, and build, on, build on it. So thank you very much, Christine. Really do okay. appreciate your time.